Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is jointly organized by Wilmer Hale and Khedan and Company. My name is Kinshuk Banerjee, and I'm part of Khedan and Company's Disputes Practice Group. The topic for today's webinar is managing cost and time in international arbitration. Um, we are all familiar with international arbitration and the importance and popularity of it cannot be gainsaid. It's by far the most favored dispute resolution mechanism for commercial matters today. Uh, from an Indian perspective, I have not seen a commercial contract in recent times which did not feature an arbitration clause. And uh, this is not surprising given uh, the pressure on our judicial system, backlog of cases and the general advantages that arbitration offers. And of course, with uh, the current scenario, uh, my, my expectation is that the popularity of arbitration is only going to increase. But despite the popularity of arbitration, a common concern among, amongst clients and most users of this system, including perhaps uh, some of you um, uh, who are uh, with us today, is that the process can sometimes be uh, time consuming, it can take very long, and it can also be very expensive. And this concern is not entirely without merit. But the good news is that over the years, tools, techniques, and strategies have evolved. In fact, some of them consciously developed to manage time and cost in international arbitration. Today's discussion really will revolve around these tools, techniques, and what more can be done to manage time and cost well. Uh, in terms of format for this webinar, we will follow a Q&A format with questions for our expert panel um, introduced very shortly. We've divided the panel discussion into three broad sections. Uh, we will first discuss the drafting of an arbitration clause. Uh, we will then move to a discussion around the tools and strategies uh, that international arbitration offers. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, and I hope uh, that we can make time for this, but we will discuss uh, the use of technology and how remote or hybrid hearings can perhaps help uh, save costs in international arbitration. We will do our best to complete the in the next 45 minutes and then uh, open up the webinar for questions from the audience. Uh, in case, in case due to time constraints, we are not able to take uh, questions from the audience. Please do uh, submit your questions using the facility provided in the webinar portal, and we will respond to you by email after the webinar, if not um, during the course of this webinar. Um, with with that, I, I will now uh, you know introduce the panelists, uh, and uh, I will be brief only because we are all keen to hear them speak. Uh, but I would strongly encourage that everyone in the audience um, look up the profiles of all our panelists uh, to truly appreciate their experience, uh, their expertise, and their contribution to international arbitration uh, really. Uh, first, we have uh, Gary Bond, who really needs no introduction. Um, Gary is the chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group at Wilmer Hale and is one of the world's preeminent authorities on international commercial arbitration. And litigation. Gary has published a number of leading works on international arbitration. He's the author of International Commercial Arbitration, published by Cluer, which is by far uh, one of the leading treatises in the field. Uh, incidentally, I have a hearing in the next one and a half hours, and I am relying heavily on some of Gary's comments in that work. Uh, we, we also have with us Stephen Finizio, who's a partner in the International Arbitration Practice Group with Hill. Again, someone who has immense experience in arbitration. He's advised clients regarding disputes under the rules of most of the well-recognized international arbitration and governed by laws of jurisdictions of uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, and the US, as well as under bilateral and uh, regional investment treaties. Steve also serves as an arbitrator. He's a member of the LCIA court. And uh, Steve too publishes extensively on issues related International Dispute Resolution is the author of A Practical Guide to International Commercial Arbitration Assessment, Planning and Strategy. We have uh, Sanjeev Kapoor, who's a senior partner in the Disputes Resolution Group at Khetan and Company, someone uh, who all of us uh, look up to for guidance and advice. With over 20 years in the profession, he has acted for clients before various tribunals, both international and domestic, uh, especially under the AGs of ICC, LCIA, and SIAC, as well as under bilateral investment treaties. He's also successfully assisted clients, a number of them, in proceedings for enforcement of international as well as domestic awards in India. Uh, next, we have Nandini Khan, 
She is also part of Qatar and Companies Disputes uh, Practice Group. Nandini has done her master's in law at the Columbia University. And um, apart from a license to practice in India, she also has license to practice in New York. She now heads a team of litigation and dispute resolution uh, team at Kolkata, um, at the Kolkata office of Khetan and Company. Again, someone who's vastly experienced in the field of arbitration and we look forward to you know, her insights. Nandini also is a member of the Executive Council of the prestigious Indian Law Institute, uh, Kolkata, and a convener of the Indian Arbitration Forum. Nandini also works with various social justice issues and serves as a board advisor to IDIA. Finally, uh, we have Darshini, the co-moderator for today's discussion, actually the lead moderator for today's discussion, uh, because shortly I will hand over proceedings. Uh, Darshali is a senior associate in the International Arbitration Practice Group at Whitman Hill. She focuses on complex multi-jurisdictional disputes. She's represented clients and institutional as well as ad hoc arbitrations under ICC, CAC, LCIA and UNCITRAL rules in civil and common law jurisdictions, including Asia, Europe and the Americas. With that, I will now request Dashini to start proceedings. Um, over to you, Dashini. Um, thanks, King Shuk. And I think before I begin, I'd just like to echo the thanks um, that you said to everyone for joining us today. We know you all are very busy, so we appreciate you um, taking the time. Hopefully, it's going to be um, an interesting and engaging session for all of you. So as King Shuk said, we're a little yeah. bit short on time. And just to make sure we have questions, we're going to be quite militant, and this is my reminder to all of the panelists as well, to be um, efficient and expeditious um, in their use of time. So jumping straight in, the first session, as King Shuk said, is, you know, we're kind of starting at the start, so we're going to look at the arbitration clause. Now, you know, we all know that the arbitration clause is, um, of course, of foundational importance to the arbitral process, but it's also notoriously referred to as a midnight clause because it's often the last things that parties negotiate, perhaps because they have more important things to be focused on. But drafting a good arbitration clause can, you know, have quite considerable impact on time and costs. And, you know, Gary and Nandini tossing the first question to you, what are some of the things you can do when you're drafting an arbitration clause to, you know, try to control time um, and focus on cost? And Gary, maybe we can start with you first. Sure. Just just very briefly, I think the the most important advice is um, KISS, K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, silly. Um, one of the most um, problematic aspects of arbitration clauses is when corporate counsel try to be too complicated or too clever. A simple model institutional arbitration clause that incorporates good institutional rules, whatever those may be, is usually by far the best solution for controlling time and costs. You can also include things like time limits and um, qualifications for arbitrators. Those can have an effect on the timeline of an arbitration. But most importantly, keep it simple. And Anthony, do you have anything to, to add on to that from your experience, particularly in the Indian context as well? Yeah. Um, so. You know, arbitration clauses were generally considered boilerplate clauses initially, like the longest time. And with ADR thriving now, of course, a lot of planning is going around it. I think the most important thing to keep in mind while drafting a clause is that, uh, you know, you don't, to the time it's drafted, to the time it's actually invoked, you don't know how much time will be, I mean, how much time will have gone by. And you also don't know which side of the arbitration you will be on. So the most, the best thing that you can do to for your arbitration clause is to infuse it with as much predictability as you can. Have um, have a clause for the scope, for the arbitral mechanism, appointment mechanism, whether it's all or three, the language. Uh, I mean, if you can put a few of these things in, I think it makes it far more easy to kind of have some predictability going forward. Thanks, Nandini. Um, you know, I think you talked about predictability in clauses and what's important to put in. You know, one question that often arises and is, I think, particularly animated in the Indian context is the debate between ad hoc and institutional arbitration. And there's increasingly been, you know, a shift towards that and focusing towards moving that. Um, and so, Steve, uh, I guess my question to you is perhaps a little bit controversial since we have Gary on the panel, but um, 
do you think it has implications um, whether you choose a cost whether you choose institutional or ad hoc and do you have a, a recommendation of whether you know it's advisable to add it into your clause well I, I think i would say that it may be surprising to an indian audience but in international practice ad hoc isn't generally seen as being slower and more expensive but there's really that that's because in international practice when people do ad hoc they usually use rules like the UNCITRAL rules that fill some of the gaps that keep the, the, the process going and they seat those arbitrations in jurisdictions where the courts will support the process and not and not interfere with the process and they pick arbitrators who are cooperating and getting the case moving so it can be even be cheaper because you're not paying an institution but institutions are responding to that they're increasingly very sensitive to costs and time issues. So they're they're changing their rules to have expedited procedures, they're adding time limits, and they're practically putting pressure on tribunals to, to deliver within those time limits, including by withholding compensation. And they're doing things to reflect the cost by keeping costs cheaper for smaller cases, for example. So institutions are, I think, rising to the challenge. And you can make choices with institutions. You can do you can go with an institution that has a light touch and is cheaper, or, or a heavier touch like the ICC, which may be more expensive. So I do think institutions are now solving a lot of the problems and create safety that you don't necessarily have with ad hoc. Thanks, Steve. Um, I think in addition to the rules, the other thing that you often see in clauses um, is a reference to the seat, which is, of course, one of the other most important aspects of an arbitration agreement. Sanjeev, you know, you are, of course, one of you know the leading practitioners in, in the country when it comes to arbitration. You've probably seen the landscape evolve dramatically in the past 20 years, you know, starting from Batia to then Balco, and now the never-ending suite of amendments to the arbitral laws in India. Um, I guess two questions for you. What would you recommend that parties look at, um, you know, when they're thinking about time and cost in their choice of seat? And, you know, drawing on your experience, are there particular disadvantages or, you know, more interestingly, advantages to choosing India as a seat? Because, you, you know, you often hear the criticisms about um, India being chosen as a seat, but what are the advantages to it um, that you see in your experience? Yeah, yeah, Darshini. So, so I, I think everybody would agree that uh, selection of an appropriate seat of arbitration is arguably one of the most important decisions parties to an arbitral agreement are called to make. Uh, this is this is for the reason that choice of seat has got very far-reaching implications. They have got uh, implications on time and cost, and obviously there are some very basic logistical issues which one needs to consider: whether seat has trained pool of arbitrators, transcriber, translators, infrastructure facility, uh, and these are obviously logistical issues which we need to consider from a cost perspective. However, I think uh, one needs to keep in mind that the seat does not merely define place where hearings will be held but it most importantly defines and dictates which court would have supervisory power of arbitration and also the scope of those powers. Therefore, the seat uh, of an arbitration ultimately will define the nationality of an award and the place where the award can possibly be challenged. So, so uh, I think inherent in the seats would be disputes regarding validity of arbitration agreement, arbitration appointment, interlocutory injunctions, et cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, many times parties will actually approach the domestic courts of the seat of arbitration in aid of arbitral process also. So I would say that when you are when you are looking at a seat, please look at a seat wherein the courts have an established pro-arbitration approach uh, and wherein due deference is given to arbitral process. Uh, this will definitely result in expeditious arbitral process and a very uh, cost-efficient arbitrations. And obviously, there are uh, seats to the knowledge of everybody uh, which are there. So obviously, one should not try and test uh, in areas where one is not very sure. Now, what are advantages and disadvantages in India uh, choosing seat uh, for arbitration? I would say, uh, uh, I think it, it would depend. It would depend upon every individual arbitration. in the Arbitration Act, which will make one kind of an arbitration suited for India and another maybe non-suited. So let me give you an example. Like in Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act, we have got Section 29A of Arbitration and Conciliation. Uh, and Section 29A requires that an arbitration seated in India, the award is required to be given within a 12, 18 months kind of a time frame, et cetera. Now, this is a kind of a statutory mandate in the Act which propels arbitrators and parties to render awards in a very time-bound manner. 
So India might be a very suited jurisdiction for not so complex commercial transaction. Um, uh, we're in this time frame of 12 to 18 months uh, because there would be pressure on the arbitrators and also on the parties to honor these timelines because of this statutory uh, requirement. However, uh, if it's a very fact heavy and a complex arbitration, uh, let's say a very, very large construction contract, then and which can't be decided in a 12, 18 months time frame, then India might not be a suited seat for arbitration. Because then you are obviously adding a layer to uh, approach the court after 18 months and seek the extension in case award is not rendered and uh, and thus adding a layer of uncertainty to the entire process. So I would say it would it would kind of depend upon uh, facts and circumstances. Uh, maybe a case wherein the assets are in India against which the award is to be enforced or interim orders are of uh, very important consequence. Uh, uh, India might be a better suited seat because uh, uh, foreign interim awards, uh, awards uh, interim awards passed in foreign jurisdictions are not per se and enforceable in India. So it will uh, definitely vary uh, from fact to fact, case to case. And I guess just one follow-up question for you. Have you, in the course of you know the past 20 years or even shorter, like the past five years, seen a change in how the courts are approaching it in terms of, in, in terms of um, dismissing maybe what they see as frivolous applications or applications that are designed to delay? Because that's obviously one of the concerns as well, how willing the courts are to indulge, um, you know, these sorts of applications. Certainly, I, I, I would say uh, uh, that uh, if, 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 if we compare it historically, today the courts are very much likely uh, not to uh, interfere in awards uh, which are raised for frivolous grounds. It is very much common for costs uh, to be imposed. Uh, which are uh, uh, actual costs, etc. So, uh, if if we say the development has taken towards the positive, I think there was some kind of a uh, what you can say uh, apprehension uh, because, as uh, uh, Steve, Steve pointed out, in India most of the arbitration is ad hoc. There are no institutional supervision and rules, etc. And uh, an award is as good as let's say who passes it. The courts were really uh, kind of initially in the initial phases of arbitration, looking very closely into the awards to see that the justice is uh, being rendered uh, uh, positively. Uh, it was a new kind of a phenomenon, but slowly and slowly, I think they have understood that this is a very well oiled kind of a system which works on its own with minimal kind of an interference. And if you see at the uh, judgments which are coming by the courts today, they are very, very much uh, uh, positive. And uh, as we speak, yesterday there was an award by Supreme Court of India wherein a challenge uh, to a uh, Vedanta award because they said uh, they involved Malaysian law has been has been set aside. So I think I think the more you look at it, uh, the more development is taking place wherein courts are taking a very non-interfering kind of a stand uh, as opposed to earlier. And maybe uh, partly uh, the change of the statute after 2015, wherein restrictions have been placed on the powers of the court, also mm -hmm. has been taken in the right spirit by the court. And uh, they are very, very less interfering today, as opposed to maybe a decade ago. Great. Um, and I'm going to pick up on one thing and you just said in your previous response, which is this point about timelines. I mean, of course, India, the, the act itself now has timelines. They apply more strictly to domestic arbitrations than I think they do to, to international arbitrations. Gary, I guess my question to you is just looking at the arbitration clause itself, um, you know, can parties stipulate timelines in that? And perhaps more controversially, do you think they could go further to say that if the timelines to render an award in the agreement are uncomplied with, you know, either the, the arbitration terminates or the agreement terminates and parties have recourse to courts? Parties certainly can do that. Arbitration clause is like any other contract in many ways. They can draft their arbitration agreement any way they wish. I'd go back to what I said previously, though, about keeping things simple. It's almost always a bad idea to put in a time limit, especially a mandatory time limit in your arbitration agreement. You don't know what sorts of disputes are going to arise in the future. 
a time limit that seems like it would make perfect sense, six months, 12 months, whatever, might turn out to be either much too short or somewhat too long, given the particular dispute that arises. Even if you put in a time limit that doesn't purport to, by express terms, be mandatory, courts might well annul an award, set aside an award, if the arbitral tribunal takes longer than the time prescribed in the arbitration agreement. That would be because, at least on some theories, the arbitration wasn't conducted in accordance with the procedures agreed by the parties. You do want to put some kind of time indication in an arbitration agreement. I would urge you to make sure that it's non-mandatory, that it's aspirational, so that the tribunal has the discretion, should matters require, to take the appropriate amount of time to resolve the party's dispute. Finally, I, I do think that institutional arbitration provides a better mechanism for ensuring timeliness. Institutions have expedited procedures and similar types of mechanisms to ensure that appropriate cases are heard very quickly. They have ad valorem fee um, schedules so that tribunals don't have an incentive to take longer rather than shorter. And they put informal and other pressure on arbitral tribunals to ensure that they resolve disputes quickly the way that parties at the end of the day want them to. Mm -hmm. um, and my last question for this session before I, I hand over to King Shook, Steve, um, this one's for you. So kind of, you know, we're talking about costs, um, which is the focus of the session. And if you were to grab the proverbial bull by its horns, could you just address the issue of costs directly in your arbitration agreement? Um, how would you do it? Is it advisable or are we violating the KISS rule? Well, that's that's precisely the question. You know, Gary has said twice, um, keep it simple. And I think that's really important. So what it means is when you're using rules, you need to know what the rules say about costs because most rules will address cost shifting, but they'll give discretion to the tribunal, but they'll assume that costs will shift to the prevailing party in some way. So if you want to do that differently, you do need to know what the rules say. And then that might be one place where you consider changing your clause. But you really have to think about why you're changing your clock, whether you're adding confusion rather than taking confusion away. And we see some parties who want to not have cost shift at all, and that usually requires changing your rules. But you have to think really carefully about the incentives of not shifting costs because it allows parties to be obstructive. The other thing to be aware of is the institutional rules and, and other guidelines are increasingly telling arbitrators to take into account obstructive behavior when allocating costs. I think they always could do that. But re referring to rules that make that clear is a way to sort of help make sure that costs can be can be take, costs can be shifted to take into account obstructive and delay, behavior and delay, but also that you're really mindful of what the cost rules are. And if you want to change it, you've, you've got to start by making sure you understand what the rules say and then being really cautious for all the reasons Gary has already said. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. I think that brings us to, to the end of this first mini session. Um, I'm going to hand over to Kingship, but if I were to give a one line summary of what we've heard, it is don't be too creative. Um, follow the tried and tested method. Um, there is wisdom in following age old approaches. Um, so Kingship, handing over to you. Thank you, Dashi. And Gary, KISS, I think, is something that everybody's going to take away from, from that session. That was very well put. Gary, you mentioned uh, uh, very briefly that institutional rules over the years, they've developed uh, mechanisms, tools, techniques to really uh, manage time and cost. Wherein that was one reason why you said that would keep your arbitration clause simple. Uh, in, in your experience, and I'll come to Steve as well, uh, what in your view are the three most effective and commonly used cost and time saving tools in international arbitration today? If you want to pick three, I know there are Three. Yeah, why don't I briefly mention um, th three of them and um, describe one, and then Steve can discuss um, the, the remaining two. I think, I think that sure. number one, emergency arbitration, number two, and um, early dismissal, number three, are relatively recent innovations in most institutional rules. Uh, expedited procedure is, I think, in many ways, the most creative. A number of institutions, SIC, ICC, others, 
have adopted institutional rules that say that for small value cases or cases of exceptional urgency, then a fast track timeline applies subject to a safety net exception if it turns out that it's impossible fairly to resolve the dispute within that timeline. The timelines vary somewhat, but in general, they're six months from constitution of the tribunal until the making of a final award. The arbitral tribunal is often a sole arbitrator instead of a three-person tribunal because the sole arbitrator can act much more quickly. The sole arbitrator can request leave, but it's relatively rarely done and even more rarely granted to go off the fast track timeline. In, for example, the experience at SIC, out of around 500 requests over the last eight years or so, expedition has been granted in about two thirds of all cases and virtually none have been taken off the fast track timeline. In my view, the expedited procedure, which applies in cases of less than around four million US dollars, has been a real hit with users. And I think they, in fact, would prefer that the dollar value be increased somewhat, although that's an open issue. Right. Steve? Yeah, really quickly, Gary mentioned emergency arbitration and early, uh, early consideration or determination of issues. Let me, let me say what emergency arbitration is and isn't, so there isn't any confusion. Emergency arbitration is not an arbitration. It is a procedure which allows an emergency arbitrator to be appointed to decide interim relief questions before a tribunal is put in place. So it fills the gap before the tribunal is put in place. And there are different approaches under different rules. So it doesn't decide the case. So you might say, why does a an extra procedure that costs more money potentially become a time and cost savings. And the reason is that it can really bring clarity. You're gonna get a week or two a decision on interim relief that may really bring the parties to their senses. And so often it can lead to either resolving the issue in a way that makes the parties think they don't wanna go forward with the arbitration or allows them to settle it. So if used right, while it's adding a step, it can also lead to time and cost savings. Obviously it can also increase costs and increase time because you're adding a step in the process. Sanjeev early, earlier talked about enforcement of interim orders. And so one of the things when you think about emergency arbitrators is thinking about doing it in a place where you potentially can have enforceable orders. And there's certain jurisdictions, many jurisdictions actually, where it's clear that interim orders can be enforced. Uh, Singapore, for example, has really taken steps to make that clear. But th that's what emergency arbitration is. It's not a decision on the merits of the case, but it may have a real impact on how the case goes forward. And then early early consideration of issues is something that should have always been available, but rules are increasingly telling arbitrators and therefore telling parties, arbitrators can decide key issues in the cases. That means claims and defenses early in the procedure. And it, or it incur those rules in court encourage the arbitrators to think in those terms to say, we don't need to go through a two year process, a year and a half process and consider everything. If there are issues that might decide the case or, or, or reduce the scope of the dispute, we should focus on those or consider whether we can focus on those early. And in some ways that's more like court proceedings where courts will do summary, summary dismissals or those sorts of, um, uh, consider those sorts of applications. So you can obviously see if used right, that that is something that can really um, create efficiency in an arbitration procedure. And, and, and to encourage this, a lot of institutions are increasingly putting express provisions in their rules to say this can be done and should be considered. The LCAA's new rules, which come into force in October, are the latest, not the first, but the latest. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think, Gary, Steve, uh, you've, you've mentioned expedited procedure, you've men mentioned summary uh, consideration and uh, emergency um, you know, arbitration. These are to be honest, uh, very frequently used even uh, by Indian parties. And we've seen the benefits of these innovations in arbitration. Uh, Sanjeev, if, if I can now ask you, is, is there any other tool or process that uh, you feel is equally uh, effective and uh, commonly used? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Gary's rule, keep it simple. So I think, I think uh, when, uh, whenever there is a dispute, every dispute uh, one has to recognize is different in many ways from earlier disputes which you have handled. And obviously that will require a different kind of a set of tools uh, for to uh, expedite it. Uh, 
but what what i have seen and this is more true for india uh, the arbitration clauses as well as the arbitration them, themselves somehow run on some acknowledged defaults um, uh, without specifically tailoring the process to the nature of ag agreement so it might be a very good idea that you always look at the nature of the agreement or the dispute and then opt for a process. Uh, uh, let me give you an example, uh, King Shuk, uh, Nandini, you have seen most of the Indian arbitration clauses and you will find that in most of the arbitration clauses in India, we opt for a three member tribunal, one appointed by each party and then uh, second, uh, both the arbitrators appointing the third arbitrator. And it's, it's kind of 90% of the cases uh, we will see uh, this kind of an agreement, uh, which is there by default. Uh, even PSUs, public sector units, will go in for this kind of a. And while it might make sense for many complex agreements and transaction, which will need a three-member tribunal, but in many cases, a sole arbitrator is enough. So uh, if 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 the nature of the contract is that uh, is not really very complex then appointment of a sole arbitrator makes the things cost efficient and also expedite uh, the arbitral process. I think the other thing which we do uh, mostly uh, uh, is that in all cases, we generally see oral evidence and cross-examination being inherent uh, and integral to the arbitral process. Uh, even if oral testimony might not uh, turn too much on the case, but one actually wants to check all the boxes in the arbitral process. I myself has participated and I am also guilty of uh, the voluminous examination in chief uh, being filed in an arbitration which was subject to lengthy cross-examination. And in many of the cases, you will find that not even one aspect of the oral testimony or cross-examination is referred to when the final submissions of the case were being uh, presented. It was mostly document-driven uh, case. So in many appropriate cases like this, uh, I think uh, especially cases which are less factual and more with interpretation of the clauses of a contract, et cetera, one can definitely consider proposing document only arbitration. Uh, this definitely um, will uh, reduce the time and cost. And uh, I, I, I find that this would be more suitable for uh, cases where there are a few contested facts and issues are uh, more straightforward forward. So uh, I, I, I think assessing the nature of uh, what is the kind of the dispute you are dealing with and then having a kind of a tool deployed of, of the armory of many tools. I think, I think that's, that's a way in which you can make the process uh, very, very uh, efficient. Right. Well, Sanjeev, I think that's, that's some very, very good practical advice, uh, to be honest. But just going back to the tools and techniques, and if I can just ask you briefly, uh, a bifurcation, for instance, is, is a process also that is very commonly used and perhaps Gary can also share his thoughts. Sajid, do you feel uh, bifurcation as a process which is now frequently used again in arbitration to really break down the arbitration? Uh, is, is that something which is useful and is that something that can be used to one's advantage in an arbitration? I only allude to this because this is another tool which I personally found very useful but we didn't discuss it. Maybe you can just spend a minute or so talking about the bifurcation process. No, certainly, I think certainly bifurcation is a very uh, important tool, but obviously uh, I think this is also a tool which is dependent upon the facts and circumstances of a particular case. Yes. Uh, and there would be, I think, some issues wherein uh, bifurcation would be very crucial, uh, not not only uh, relevant. Let's, let's say if there is a dispute which is going to uh, limitation issues, uh, then obviously I think bifurcating it and then deciding the limitation issues first before you actually go into uh, fact evidence and expert evidence and quantum phase, et cetera, makes kind of uh, sense. Because if, if it's barred by limitation, then why, why does the parties go through the entire rigorous process of going through a detailed arbitration? I think uh, it, is, it is a tool which is uh, a useful tool. Uh, in given facts and circumstances of a particular case, wherein it has got the ability of uh, uh, disposing of the arbitration um, at a very early stage or early phase. Yeah, I mean, I've seen that uh, uh, myself. But it's all very well to talk about uh, tools, techniques, methods, mechanisms in theory. I mean, we have a host of innovations 
that we see in institutional rules and uh, uh, very exciting innovations. But my question really is, does it all work in practice? And uh, if I can request Gary, uh, maybe you uh, can share with us some experiences, draw on your experience and share with us uh, where these tools have been used effectively uh, in, in, in practice. Uh, sure. I, I asked this question. I, I'm sorry. I uh, will break it break it up into tools uh, used for the benefit of claimants, and then I'll come to respondents as well. So maybe you can talk about uh, how it's been used for the benefit of claimants first. Sure, and and very briefly. Um, I think bifurcation can be of benefit both to to respondents and and to claimants. If you bifurcate a particular issue that can be resolved very quickly and that is dispositive either of the whole case or a major segment of the case, you can obviously both save time and money. And from a claimant's perspective, assuming that you're resolving the merits of a claim, get an award on a simple issue sooner rather than later. On the other hand, there have been empirical studies done of how bifurcation actually works in practice in the investor state context. Professor Susan Frank a lengthy study on it, and the results of that were a little surprising. They showed that in bifurcated cases, the time taken to resolve the dispute was actually significantly longer, on the order of around 30 percent, than in unbifurcated cases. I think great care, therefore, has to be used in deciding whether or not to bifurcate a case. On the other hand, I think expedited procedure, from a claimant's perspective, almost always is in in the interests of of a claimant assuming that they have a small value and relatively straightforward claim right and gary can you just very briefly talk about some case where you've actually used it effectively um, any of these processes yeah the in in the bifurcation context uh, a case where there was a relatively simple contractual issue coupled with a rather complex non-contractual issue. Having the tribunal decide on a separate basis while the non-contractual um, dispute went forward, non-contractual submissions went forward, have the tribunal decide the contractual claim produced a, a, a very satisfactory result. It allows the claimant to, in a sense, get justice on something that's straightforward while something that's more difficult can be considered at greater length. Steve, if I can ask you, uh, in practice, uh, the general perception, I think, in arbitration is that these tools are meant to benefit the claimants only. But I, I want to ask you if, you're, in your experience, you've seen respondents benefit from these tools processes. Uh, so yeah, I, I have. I, I I mentioned earlier early decisions on key issues. I had a case a few years ago, large and complex uh, gas supply context, where we as respondent said that no matter what the claimant said, no matter if their facts were correct, they couldn't win on the law, and there should be an early consideration of whether they could win no matter what. And we had a procedure in which we had a, a quick hearing, a one-day hearing where we argued those issues. The tribunal said, you know what, we're not going to kick the case out. They were cautious, but we have serious doubts about the strength of the case. And, and as the case proceeded, and it came time for the claimant to uh, submit its first big brief, they, so, they said they wanted more time. They were having some difficulties. And we said to them, you know what, just dismiss the case with prejudice. You, you can't win. The tribunal's already told you that. And they did. You know, so there you see a respondent using uh, one of these tools to get a case decided early. I'm also at the tail end of an emergency arbitration procedure. We had a hearing on Monday. It, in, in the course of 10 days, there were three big briefs. We represent the responding party. We did two things. We did ca a counter application for emergency relief. Um, so we took it, we turned it around on the claimant. And I do think that while the process has been a bit shocking for the parties because uh, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud. I think both sides will have spent about a billion dollars in, in 10 days or two weeks on, on this procedure. I do think that no matter what happens, we're not going to probably have a full arbitration because I think the claimant now realizes that it has serious difficulties with getting what it wants. And it was using the emergency arbitration procedure to try to, to get ahead. And when it 
if that's not successful, I think it will reconsider its whole approach. And then just really quickly, we talked about bifurcation. Let me mention, I've had cases that have been trifurcated. So a, a jurisdiction phase, a merits phase, and a quantum phase. And I, I want to say two things about that. There are those perceived benefits that you don't necessarily spend the money on the later phases if you get it knocked out early. And in, in those cases, the respondent usually wants that jurisdictional phase because they want to end the case early. But as Gary said, you don't have to think hard to realize that that can lead to a vastly longer and vastly more expensive process. So you have to be very smart about using bifurcation to uh, advance your goals. Right. That's that's really interesting. And, uh, you know, as a respondent, you don't always need to be concerned. Uh, and, and often these processes can can be used to your advantage. But just stepping away from institutional rules uh, briefly, Nandini, if if, if uh, my next question is for you, um, are there any effective methods to save costs or expedite arbitrations in an international arbitration seated in India and, and which is governed by the Indian Arbitration yeah. and Conciliation? Because oh, as we, can as you we discussed, uh, a lot of the Indian arbitrations are ad hoc arbitrations. They are governed by the Indian Arbitration Act. So question often arises, is, is, is that a good idea? Are there any benefits to that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the Sanjeev already mentioned the international, uh, I mean, the timelines which can be, you know, the, the arbitration seated in India are now trying to, it's aspirational, but they're trying to meet it. But uh, the fast track arbitration uh, section on 29B with the new amendments now has a six, a six month deadline. And it's based on all, all um, written pleadings and there's very little scope for oral evidence or even, uh, you know, submissions. And it's only if there's a clarification required that you could be called upon to provide that. So, um, the benefit of an expedited procedure is there in the Arbitration Act itself. And unlike, uh, you know, the Act, in fact, does not provide a cap of an amount for some if people want to kind of, you know, uh, go forward with the expedited procedure. So I think that's a huge uh, impetus that the Act has given. Um, then there was also, uh, Stephen was and Sanjeev both mentioned about the interim awards and enforceability. So I think a big advantage that, it, uh, that India has in that sense is that under section 31 and uh, you have enforceability of partial awards or the interim awards which decide an issue uh, you know, finally so that part also is something that you know gives the ICAs which are seated in India a huge advantage so if there's an bifurcation and there's an issue on uh, an admitted due uh, like a summary proceeding that can be put into execution immediately so I think these are some of the uh, tools that are under the act the new amendments give a huge impetus even to the ad hoc arbitrations that uh, the ICS that may take place in India. No, Nandini, it's 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 uh, great that you mentioned the interim award bit because that is uh, uh, very infrequently used, if I may say, and that's a yeah. that's a very powerful tool that is available for ad hoc mm -hmm. arbitrations. Um, in fact, in in orders also are now enforceable under the uh, new amendments. Uh, under Section 17. So I think the uh, yes. Arbitration Act now, as a self-sustaining court, gives a lot of tools like uh, which can, you know, make the arbitration regime a lot stronger than all the before. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think there's been a change and a very positive development since 2015. But really, that that was that was my last question uh, as far as uh, this session is concerned, and I'm going to request Darshan to. Uh, take things forward as far as uh, use of technology and remote hearings and arbitration is concerned. Thanks, Thank Kishuk. you. Um, I think it's fair to say that no webinar today would be complete if we did not talk about technology and remote hearings. Um, so we're going to, of course, do that today as well. Um, you know, the increased use of technology is, of course, being heralded as one of the, the great upsides of, of the pandemic, if you can call, if you can call anything an upside. Um, because it's just made things more efficient in arbitration, or so they say. So what I'd like to unpack with all of you today is, is this a slightly rose-tinted view of the world? Um, is remote hearings really all that it's made out to be? But before we jump into remote hearings, um, Sanjeev, I guess the first question I have for you is, 
you know, what are the sorts of you know, tools in technology or how can technology actually, um, you know, change the way in which you, you spend your time and costs in arbitration? So, so uh, I think we are getting used to technology and, and uh, getting used to it by leaps and bounds. Uh, and I, I, I read these words somewhere in which, and I fully concur with them. They, they say technology is known. This is yeah. very true and apt. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Sanji. Yeah. So, so I think this phrase actually is very true and apt in the space of arbitral proceedings also. Mm. So, so let's start with very basics when we, we talk about technology, the basic things like emails, telephonic and video conferences. Uh, I think these have uh, taken away the need for physical presence at one location. And obviously this has resulted in uh, both time as well as cost reduction in arbitration. Uh, the parties as well as arbitrators are getting used to it more and adopting it more willingly. Uh, but, Giving my example, I had many video conferencing platforms on my uh, laptop two years uh, before also, before COVID happened. But whenever it came to a, let's say, multi-personal call, I will always circulate a dial-in connection. And this is despite knowing very well that a video call is a more richer medium of interaction than obviously a telephone call. Um, but uh, uh, today, a few things, actually, the things have reversed. Now, uh, everybody has become very used to uh, WebEx, Zoom, Teams, Skype for Business. Uh, and actually, it, it's reversed in a sense now. Because even today, the audio calls happen on video platforms with webcams switched off. Okay. Uh, so so, so it, it's kind of changing and people are kind of uh, adapting. And in fact, COVID times have shown us uh, that uh, the technology has become important, not merely from cost or time efficiency perspective, but in fact, it goes to the very fundamental issue of access to justice itself in these times. Because with, without technology, there can't be any hearings and therefore access to justice is going to imperil in these times. Uh, but, but I think these, these kind of transmitting messages and uh, holding procedural conferences over video uh, platforms are uh, is not, uh, uh, what we find that arbitration is uh, limited to, it has become quite evolved. Um, it is being used to process. Um, for example, information technology tools today are being used for complete case management of arbitration. Documents and management softwares are there, and these ensure that all the documents are submitted in arbitration, uh, and these are generally run through a very exclusive single platform all pleadings, exhibits, reports would be uploaded on cloud and accessible to arbitrators and parties to arbitration. Uh, uh, many of these platforms can also have integrated communication systems wherein stakeholders can uh, communicate through these platforms itself. Uh, so I think, I think these platforms are making documents accessible at all times, irrespective of the location and easily searchable in an uh, electronic format. Uh, so, so it's it's making uh, it cost efficient in that sense. Uh, obviously, there is a initial cost of investing in such systems and platforms, but in complex and large scale uh, arbitrations, not only such systems make the process efficient and speedy, but in the long run, uh, they definitely mitigate costs. Uh, yeah. We are today having uh, depositions and final hearings uh, remotely and seamlessly through technology. Uh, and, and these remote hearings are based on technical solutions, which are actually an integration of technologies such as video conference platforms, chat rooms, integrating do document management softwares, etc. So these are really very evolved platforms where you can interact, share documents, have separate breakout rooms. Uh, in fact, providers are there. They will provide you for modes of electronic presentation of evidence also, which allow you to present your case through digital slideshows, video repositions, video presentations, etc. So, so uh, they have got further options for transcriptions, secure chat facilities for each party, etc. So these are, these are definitely very efficient and cost effective uh, tools as they avoid the need of people to converge from different parts of the world to one location for a physical hearing. Uh, as opposed to this, everybody can be, conduct, uh, everybody can be connected virtually and proceed with the arbitration. And my sense is that uh, 
uh, after covid also this is something which is going to remain there because people will find it uh, are finding it and will find it so efficient um, and seamless that uh, they will like to continue with these platforms mm -hmm. Thanks, Sanjeev. I think you, you made a very interesting point um, about access to justice, you know, particularly in, in the current landscape, if you don't switch to technology, it becomes an access to justice issue. But in flipping that on its head a little, um, you know, there are also these concerns that you often hear about due process. Um, and I guess, you know, taking that and segueing to you, Gary, um, are there circumstances in which you'd say a remote hearing is not suitable? Um, and, you know, in, in answering this question, I'm going to ask you to, of course, draw on multiple hats that you wear because you've now sat as as arbitrator in, in you know, cases during the, the COVID era where I'm sure you've had people complain about due process, um, but you've also had to argue for and against it as counsel. Um, so what, what are your takes on, on remote hearings? Does it work? Is it suitable? When is it not suitable? Sure. A, a couple of thoughts, Dash. Um, first, remote hearings very clearly are doable, and they're also clearly preferable to an alternative of no hearing at all. Justice delayed is, as they say, justice denied. And if you have to go forward remotely, then that's better than not going forward at all. Second, there are circumstances when you just can't go forward remotely, sometimes in particular regions of the world in particular uh, situations, a party or its council just doesn't have reliable access to the internet. It's unusual, but it nonetheless happens. And in those cases, I think tribunals have to exercise great caution or be creative about how a remote hearing might be conducted. Equally, time zones can create huge issues. If you have parties in, for example, Singapore, Europe, and the Americas, finding a time when everybody can be on a single platform for more than a couple hours can be very difficult. The final point that I would make is that these technologies all are not perfect. In-person hearings aren't perfect either, but when you're in a virtual hearing, and I spend most of my time as, as counsel as opposed to wearing my other hats, when you're in a virtual hearing, you don't see the tribunal in the same way that you do in an in-person hearing. Losing that personal connection, if I can use that term, is a real issue for, for counsel. And I think as with in-person hearings, but perhaps even more so, it's essential in remote hearings to have counsel that is really familiar with the technology, familiar with how you use that technology to make up for the loss of the same type of personal connection that you have. You need, of course, to know how to manage the documents, how to communicate with your team, how to make sure you don't get confused between the various screens on your desk, but figuring out how you stay connected with the tribunal in order to persuade them at the end of the day is what's really essential. Um, just picking up slightly on what you said, um, the last bit focused you know, on, on how it is from the council's perspective. But when you're sitting across on the other side of the table as an arbitrator, have you found that it kind of changes how you perceive a case or your interaction with counsel? Do you find you know, methods of cross-examination less effective when, when they're done uh, by video than compared if they were done in person? One, one hears a variety of things. One hears generalizations about Zoom fatigue and tribunals being more or less um, passive in terms of questions. In my experience, and I really do think every every hearing is unique, every hearing, like every arbitration, is is a snowflake, it's, it's unique. But in, in my experience, tribunals tend, and in particular the co-arbitrators, tend to be a little more passive in, in remote hearing. Perhaps it's because of unfamiliarity with the technology, perhaps it's because of Zoom or Zoom. But I think the co-arbitrators tend to be less interventionist. I think that it offers opportunities to counsel in some ways. I think uh, counsel, you, you would think that using remote technology makes it harder to cross-examine. In my experience, that's not necessarily the case. In an odd way, it makes it harder to defend against the cross-examination. Uh, but again, mm -hmm. I, 
really underscore the fact that every case is is different. And the important thing is to to bring experience and tools to bear with this new technology. Right. Um, yeah, I can only briefly add to what you said about having to manage multiple screens and streams and devices, because I found that your multitasking abilities have um, have really got to exponentially improve to, to manage, I think, doing a video conference when you don't have your juniors like passing your notes repeatedly, you've got to keep track of your WhatsApp messages. Um, so I think as council, it's definitely pushing us to our limits as well. Um, we were going to cover more, more issues, but you know, we're running quite close to, I think, the end of our session. And Steve wants to say something. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Steve. I just want to say we've heard using technology to save time and cost, but both Sanjeev and Gary also flagged issues that I think need to be said out loud. If you take into account Zoom fatigue, if you're going to use remote hearings um, to avoid the cost of travel, the, the, the cost of hotel, you do have the technology costs, but you also may end up with more hearing days spread out over more time, which can lead to higher council costs, which are much higher than hotels and and uh, the, the, the travel costs that you're saving. So um, while, as Gary just said, every case is different, you, you can't just have a blanket assumption that if you do it remotely, it's going to be cheaper. It may actually be more expensive if you don't plan it properly and if you don't manage it properly. No, I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I was going to open the floor up to war stories, but like I said, I think we're cutting a little bit close to the finish line. And I do want to raise a couple of questions that we've received from the audience. Um, and you know, whoever shoots their hand up first can answer the question. We'll do it uh, school style. Um, so the first question that we've received is, are there any ways to limit costs associated with expert evidence and witness statements? Um, and I guess the, the question is slightly open-ended, so maybe two ways to approach it, if, if I may. Can you do anything in, in the arbitration clause? Can you do anything in structuring the procedure? Or can you just as you know, counsel managing the case, do anything to help your client save costs in that regard. Steve. <laughs> well, look, uh, it's it's hard to try, try to put limits on evidence, particularly witness evidence. It starts to raise due process questions and also shoot, it raises the issue of shooting yourself in the foot or cutting off your nose to spite your face to use various cliches, because if you put those sorts of limits in, in your arbitration agreement and then you're the one who needs to rely on expert evidence or witness statements you may have you may have damaged your own ability to protect your rights but i do think one thing that is cultural but important is in certain jurisdictions witness statements are used as briefs to rewrite the case through to have the lawyers write the case english lawyers love to write their the, the, the solicitors love to write the case through witness statements and that doesn't help them and it drives up costs it's not effective and so you can police your own behavior and, and be smart about the time and cost involved by how you choose to use witness statements and expert reports. Mm -hmm. And Anthony, did you have anything to maybe add to that? How can you control costs with witness statements? So think, um, on the evidence part, like one of the things that is uh, relevant, that may be relevant is in the time of cross. A lot of the uh, times that there are needless questions that are allowed and go on for days and days. Uh, what Stephen just said about uh, and I said about you know the virtual hearings carrying on. We, we literally had this right now, an arbitration that was taken on to the virtual platform went on for 13 days as opposed to the initial 30, uh, three, and the cross that was allowed was over questions which went on for 10 days. So the arbitrator really needs to kind of you know clamp down on the relevancy of the questions. So I think that's also one way that you, you will cut short on that kind of uh, uh, the deposit time the cross time. So the arbitrator um, needs to control that part of it. Yeah, so I guess it's kind of a multifaceted approach. There's things that council can do and there's things that the arbitrators can do as well. Absolutely. Um, Sanjeev, there's a question specifically for you. Um, since early dismissal is not recognized in Indian law, is there any way an award passed on that basis um, can be held unenforceable by the Indian courts? I wouldn't say that. I, I, I would say that an Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act uh, defines award. And it defines award uh, as an any, uh, any uh, order which will dispose of an issue finally. Uh, so, so 
if let's say you are asking for an early dismissal and that early dismissal goes into let's say and and again quoting the case uh, which uh, uh, we have quoted earlier of limitation and an arbitral tribunal finds that uh, it's barred by limitation then that is actually a final award and uh, mm -hmm. as per indian arbitration and conciliation act that would be perfectly enforceable in india so so anything which kind of finally disposes of any issue finally in india would be enforceable as an award mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's the answer the, the person wanted to hear, <laughs> but it, it is so it's good to know it's good to have the clarity that you know there's a wide range of, of awards that can be enforced. Um one yeah, more I, uh, Sorry, I, I think I think I, I think it's important not to be misguided by the terminology as to how an award is what is the heading of the award. I think I think that's how, uh, that uh, is slightly misleading in many senses. I think you look at the award and you look at the definition. see whether it's enforceable or not this terminology sometimes is very misleading mm -hmm. um one other question and, and gary maybe you can you can take this one um do institutional rules permit remote slash virtual arbitrations and can an agreement on a seat or venue come in the way of a remote hearing so I think most institutional rules either explicitly or implicitly permit remote or, or virtual hearings. There's a suggestion that the ICC rules, which call for an in-person hearing, don't allow remote hearings. But the ICC has subsequently sought to clarify whether it would be effective, subsequently sought to clarify that uh, in-person hearing can actually be conducted remotely because we still see one another and hear one another personally. I think the better the better drafted institutional rules like SIC and LCIA either explicitly provide for remote hearings, that's the, the LCIA rules in their recent revisions, or make it clear that the arbitral tribunal has very broad procedural discretion, which national courts have almost uniformly held, includes the authority to hear witness examination and oral submissions remotely. There are a few countries, I think China is, is, appears to be one of them, where if you seat the arbitration there, you may well run into difficulties if a tribunal orders a remote hearing over the objection of one party. Virtually all jurisdictions allow a tribunal with both parties' agreement to conduct a remote hearing, but apparently in China, a, a tribunal does not have the authority to order a remote hearing if one party objects. It's unclear whether that view will hold up in the long term, given the, the pandemic, but it certainly is an outlier compared to international practice in, in most jurisdictions, which allow a tribunal to conduct a remote hearing, notwithstanding um, the one party's objection. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just recalled the, the case, Anthony, that you mentioned, which which brought uh, a smile to my face that you've recently had a 90 year old arbitrator say that he's now become very technologically savvy, but he was still made to do an in person hearing. Yeah, so basically, uh, we, my client was the claimant in a matter, and uh, the respondent wanted a continuance and said that we will have only physical hearing because for a final hearing and final cross, he needed to have a physical hearing for that. And the uh, one of the tribunals was the 90 year old. Uh, judge a retired judge and was like no i am quite familiar with the technology now and you know i would prefer uh, you know going virtual and um, don't think of me as an old man and everybody was in splits but the uh, respondent definitely uh, insisted on uh, you know going physical so we we faced a physical hearing subject to how the situation pans out of the pandemic and was that because um, there was a legal basis for why they insisted on physical hearings or was it just that the tribunal decided they didn't want to deal with with the hassle of a due process objection? Yeah, I, I think that was it because the uh, the respondents council was very uh, adamant on the point that there wouldn't be uh, a very good hearing if it was on virtual with tech issues and, uh, you know, the, the, the cross not happening well enough. So, the judges had to accede to it, but with a rider that if the pandemic doesn't improve, it will go virtual. Right, right. 
Um, well, I think we've uh, slightly crossed our one hour mark and I think um, we've been very good on time and I have to thank all of our panelists for heeding my early cautionary tone about being disciplined in their responses. It was cost effective and time effective, uh, I think we can say. Um, so thank you to the panelists, of course, for, for you know taking the time to, to share their experiences and to answer some of the very good questions we received from the audience. And of course, thank you to everyone who's taken the time to join us today as well. Um, you know, we haven't, of course, had the time to take all of your questions. So as King Shook said, if you do have any questions for any of the panelists, um, please do email us and we'll, we'll respond to you in writing or maybe over a call. Um, but I guess that, that leaves me to wish everyone um, a happy afternoon in India and um, a happy, well, wherever you are, happy morning, happy evening. Um, and uh, take care and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.